All right, let's get into our time of study. That's what we're here for. Uh, Matthew said this morning he come to get his fix, and I come to get my fix. He, said, he, he says, Brother Ron, I'm addicted to the, to the ministry of the saints. I say, yes, brother, that's a good addiction, right? Mm -hmm. Let's talk about that. Um, go with me, if you will, to uh, 2 Corinthians. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. We're continuing our look verse by verse through our Apostle Paul's book of 2 Corinthians. Uh, I'm going to read uh, a, a couple of verses, and we're just going to give thanks to the Lord as we begin of this study. In, in chapter 6, verse 7, uh, Paul says, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left, by honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report, as deceivers and yet true, as unknown and yet well known, as dying and behold we live, as chastened and not killed as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing all things. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for that truth. And Father, we thank you that above all, we, we do possess the Lord Jesus Christ, your precious Son, our glorious Savior, the one who came to this sin-cursed world, this God-forsake, uh, God-hating world, as God the Son, and he died on that cruel and criminal cross for our sins, Father. He had no sins of his own. He was perfect and impeccable, the spotless lamb of God, but he died for us. He shed his precious blood to make atonement for our sins. So, Father, we thank you for that wonderful blessing of the life of Christ given to us by faith alone, by your grace, plus no works. Father, we thank you for the Holy Scriptures which we're going to study today. We thank you that we can have the holy word of the, of the almighty God to, to, to know your, 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 what, what you think, Father, to have your mind. In, in our thinking. So we thank you for the blessing of the Holy Scripture. Father, we thank you for our brothers and sisters in Christ, uh, like Brother Benjamin and others, those who are here and those who follow by way of the internet. We thank you for them. We know how, how hard it is, Father, to be in this world without the support of saints. So especially for those who don't have a grace assembly to attend or even one other person to, to talk to about these things, we pray for your great mercy in their lives. Thank you that we can minister to them through the blessing of technology. So, Father, as we go forth in our study of the word today, give us great insight, understanding, and wisdom. And most importantly, as always, a greater appreciation of your Son, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's in his wonderful name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, we're gonna, we, we, we start looking at the issue of the armor last time. And I showed you how David, we ended on how David, uh, he, he didn't take Saul's armor uh, as he fought Goliath. David himself was a young man at the time, a small man, and, and, and as you know, Saul the king, who was all frightened with all them, we, we ended on that whole thing where they defeated the Philistines, uh, his armor wasn't right. David had spiritual armor, and to, today we're going to look more about that as well as our spiritual protection. If you look at verse number seven, by the word of truth, by the power of God, we saw those the last uh, few times. We, we ended two weeks ago by the armor of righteousness. Now, notice he says on the right hand and on the left. That issue of the armor of righteousness, what is armor? It's a full body protection. And what God wants to do is give us full body spiritual protection to protect us from head to toe because we're in a war. If you don't understand that we're in, we're in a war, we're in a spiritual war, you, you need to know that. All of us are. Satan is constantly attacking us. Satan hates marriage. Satan hates family. He hates order, law and order. He loves chaos. He loves destruction. He's, 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 the, he's the one who wants to destroy. Uh, the Lord Jesus Christ said that the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy, right? But God has given us righteousness. And particularly when he talks about that armor of righteousness in verse number seven, notice what righteousness is. Remember what he talks about, faith and love? Faith and love. The breastplate of righteousness, the breastplate of faith and love. If you have faith in the Lord Jesus and love to all saints, that will protect you from Satan's wiles because Satan wants people to not believe Christ, unbelief, and he wants you to not minister one to another. He wants you to hate your brother the way we saw Cain, the first murderer, hate his brother, Abel. And he murdered his brother. Now notice, it didn't say the arm of righteousness on the right hand, it's, I mean in the right hand, it says on the right hand and on the left. It's protecting all sides, okay, as a good soldier. You're always aware and ready for the, 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 the attack. 
I want to show you a couple more of these. Go, go with me, if you will. Go to uh, Romans chapter 13. Go back to Romans chapter 13, where the Apostle Paul talks more about armor. We're going to see this, and we're going to see the book of Ephesians chapter 6. Notice in Romans chapter number 13, and Paul's going to speak about armor. And the fact that he constantly brings up armor, at least three times we know God wants us to beware that we're in this battle. He wants us to have spiritual protection. And notice what he says here in Romans chapter 13. Just to get a little uh, context, notice verse 10. Um, why don't we have to keep the Ten Commandments as grace believers? It doesn't mean that the Ten Commandments aren't holy, righteous, and good. Paul says they are in the book of Romans. But God has put us under grace. And grace can accomplish what the law can't. All the law can do is put you in fear. But he hasn't given us the spirit of bondage again to fear, he says in Romans. That's right, it's bondage. It's legalism. So instead of putting us under the law, God put us on a, a more powerful motivation called God's grace, his love and grace. And notice this, how we're to deal with others. Verse number 10, love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. What fulfills the law in our lives? Not us trying to keep the Ten Commandments, no. It's, it's loving one another. In fact, not just uh, our brothers and sisters in Christ, but it's loving even the lost. We're to love all men. And how do you know you love someone? You don't work ill will toward them. Okay? God looks at the intents of the heart. It doesn't mean we don't harm people accidentally, okay? You might say something that you, that you didn't know was offensive to someone. That's fine. If they tell you that, be the bigger person says, I'm sorry, no, no offense. Basically, love worketh no offense, no ill towards his neighbor. Don't have ill will towards anyone. And only you and God know whether you have ill will towards anyone. I never want to have ill will towards anyone, even if they're my enemy or they hate me. I, I, they would be my enemy because of their choice. I don't want to have problems with anyone. As a grace believer, I want to love everyone. And how do you know you love? Verse 10, love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Don't work ill will. Have no ill will towards others. Therefore, verse 10, love is the fulfilling of the law. Verse 11, but there's something else that we have in mind. Sometimes people ask me, how are you doing, brother? And I say, waiting for the Lord to come. I don't have any desire for anything in this world. Although I did tell Krista, I said on my 50th birthday of the Lord Terrace, I do have one thing. I said, I don't want anything. Y'all listen back there, my parents. What, what is it? What is it? What is it? No, I don't want no party. I want to go to a party. Yeah, I, I, want to, I want to go to a fantasy camp, a baseball fantasy camp, hopefully with the Chicago Cubs or White Sox. It, what that is is you go down to Arizona, 50-year-old guys, like, like that would be in four years, and that's why y'all got to save up now. It's coming up in four years and two days. <laughs> That's the only thing I want. I don't want any other material things. I did tell Chris that I want to go and play baseball against the guys who I watched playing ball growing up in Chicago, the White Sox and Cubs. That would be, a, that would be, that would be the only thing I want. And I said on my 50th, because anything after that, I don't think I'm going to be able to run down the bases. <laughs> I got to start getting in shape now, OK? <laughs> I ate a salad the other day. Chris said, you eating a salad? I said, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to prepare for my 50th birthday in four years so that I can uh, do the baseball fantasy camp. I don't want to pull a hammy. So, so that's all I want, parents. Just all you know, put it together, okay? But that's all I want. <laughs> but besides that, I don't want anything in this world. I don't care. I love the saints. Notice in verse 11, and that knowing the time. Krista say, every time we go past a ballpark, you just look out there. I love baseball. I grew up on it. My uncle was in the minor leagues. I met all the players when I was young. And I'll just be driving, and, and the lights are on, and I just want to go out there, you know. I, I actually worked for the Cubs when I was a, a, a 16 years old. I worked with uh, Harry Carey in the press box. I loved it. Um, but you know the time, verse 11, and that knowing the time. What time is that? That, it now, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. And what Paul is talking about is spiritual slumber. Over in Ephesians, when we go there, we're going to go to chapter 6, but in chapter 5, he says, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. And what Paul is saying is, even though you're a member of the body, you can be spiritually asleep. 
And the way you do that is that you're not listening to the Apostle Paul. That's why we rightly divide the word of truth. That's why we teach the grace message so that you can be awake. Notice what he says in verse 11, and that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. Why? For now, everybody get this, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. Now that salvation, the word salvation is like any other word. You have to look at the context. He's not talking about the salvation of our soul from hell. He's talking about our deliverance out of this sin-cursed world. From the day you got saved, Dodie, she doesn't mind me giving her a hit. She, she's, she has a wonderful uh, mind. She has uh, been, been blessed by God physically. She'll be 88 on the 16th. And from the day you got saved, Dodie, to this day, it's been decades, right? It's been decades and decades. Imagine what Paul says back there. He said, the, from the day you got saved to the day he's going to save us from the, not just the penalty of sin, but from the very presence of sin, it's that time. He's rem reminding us that the judgment seat of Christ is coming, the rapture and the judgment seat. And so we need to live life knowing that the righteous judge is coming. And when you do, you will not work ill. I remember dear brother James Mason back in uh, Minnesota. I did his funeral uh, a, a few years back. And when I visited uh, our old church there, Twin Cities Grace Fellowship, my study was called the Judgment Seat of Christ. And during the time of, uh, we, we had a meal afterwards and we were sitting with James and the Saints. And I still had the title up there on the chalkboard. And he says, Brother Ron, you never have to worry about how I'm gonna deal with saints because I fear that. And he turned around, he was, his back was to the wall. He says, see that title you got there, the judgment seat of Christ? He says, I fear the righteous judge. And James did. He was a good man. We're gonna see James again. We're gonna see Dina, Sister Dina, back in Minnesota and all the saints who went. And when we're gonna see him is that day, that day of salvation, redemption day. Ephesians, he calls it. Look at verse number 12. The night is far spent. What is the night? The night is the time period in scripture where the Lord Jesus Christ is, is not on this earth. He says, when I'm in the world, I am the light of this world. It is daytime. Well, now that the Lord Jesus Christ is there in heaven, he ha until he comes back, it, it's going to be nighttime, as it were. Spiritual darkness is going to be there. When the Lord returns, all that spiritual darkness is going to go away. When he rules and reigns, it's going to be light, spiritual light. Notice what he says here, verse 12. The night is far spent. The day. What's that? That's the day of the Lord Jesus. His day. The day is at hand. And Paul had these saints understanding the judgment seat of Christ so well, he didn't even have to mention it. He just says, the day. Now, you, you, we, we might ask what day, but they knew. The Romans knew what day. It's the day of the Lord Jesus. The day of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 12, the night is far spent. The day is at hand. When something is at hand, it's within reach. Now, if that was true back when Paul wrote the book of Romans, his sixth book he wrote, one, two, three, four, five, six, how much more nearly 2,000 years later? If the Lord's return was imminent then, and it was, how much more today? I believe we are that generation that will not taste the physical death to the Lord come. I pray that, yep, I pray that every day. Join me in that prayer. Make that part of your prayer life that we go. I told Dodie she can't go be with the Lord until she turns 90 at least. So you got two years and about 12 days, Dodie, okay? You can't go. I said after her 90th birthday, then she can want to go. She missed Charlene. And being 90, your body don't, I, knowing 90 year olds where the lost are saved they say why am I still here I want to go <laughs> I get that how much more for Dodie who's a, who's a, who's a grace believer want to be with the Lord and so I pray that we all go together that's what I tell Dodie I want us to go together right. amen Lord so until that happens look at verse 12 the night is far spent the day is at hand let us therefore cast off the works of darkness. We grace believers ought not to be part of the dark world, the works of darkness. Cast them off. 
And let us, notice he says, let us, let us, this is our choice. Put on, you have to put something on, the armor of what? Light. Listen, spiritual protection happens from when we choose to put on the protection that God has given us, and that's the light of God's word. <clears throat> light, thy word is a, is, a, is a light, a lamp and a light. Where do we find light? It's in God's word. I'm happy I'm a morning bird. That's one of the reasons I hate missing Sundays. I'm not in the same mood on Wednesday nights because my body says it's almost shutdown time at 9 o'clock, right? But I love Sundays mornings. The sun's shining. I get to come be with the saints. It's nothing better. It's the best day of my life or my week, Sunday mornings, because I get up. I get to serve Krista. She's a night owl. I let her sleep in. Get fix. <laughs> I get, get my fix of the saints, right? <laughs> I go, I take care of Chris, take care of Jay Lynn, then I come and, and take care of the saints. I, I, this is my favorite day. No matter what's going on in my life, and I deal with our life and other saints. I got hundreds of saints and their, their needs on my heart. But for the time we're here, it all goes away. It, this is like a taste of heaven, I feel. Do you know a grace church is supposed to feel like it gives us a glimpse of heaven? The, the beautiful fellowship with the saints and the word of God. You should feel when you're here like this. If, if you're like me, the moment we leave this place, you can't get out this parking lot without somebody hunking at you and giving you, the, you know, <laughs> doing something. <laughs> so at least you should come to an assembly where we're gracious and loving towards each other, right? Okay, for this little time. Well, that's the way it's supposed to be. And, 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 and what makes us that way is nothing in ourselves. It's that armor of light that we get from the word. Why I teach Paul's doctrine verse by verse is so that we can put on that armor of light. It's our spiritual protection. Okay? Uh, one more. Go over to Ephesians, if you will. Go over to Ephesians chapter 6. In his latter ep epistle, Ephesians, Paul's going to talk about this issue of the armor. Here he's going to call it the whole armor of God. Remember, David did not take Saul's armor. Do you know that King Saul would have had the best armor in Israel? You ever think about that? He's the king. He needs to be protected. Kings in that day led the battles, right? You know that day that David had uh, Bathsheba? He stole Uriah, the Hittite's wife, Bathsheba. It was the day when the kings went out to battle, and David said, no, I'm not going today. Put Joab on it. That day, her husband's on, in the battle. He sees her. They hang, up, they, they hang out, they hung, hung out on, top, on the rooftop. He sees this beautiful Jewish woman there bathing naked and so forth. She didn't have to worry about men. All the men were in battle, though at least the younger men. Well, the king sees her. He looks. He says, hmm, she's with that Hittite. Remember, Uriah wasn't even an Israeli. He was a Hittite who had come over because he loved the, God, the people of Israel and the God of Israel. And I think David had this air of superiority. Why should that Hittite have be with this beautiful woman? I can, he's the king. We were, Ryan and I were talking about it. We're learning all about the issue of wives and concubines in Scripture. King David's son, who he had by Bathsheba later, is named Solomon. He had 1,000 women at once, 700 wives and 300 concubines. I might do a study on Prophecy Wednesday about that. A lot of people ask about that issue of wives and concubines. We've been talking about these things. I might, I might bring that up. I, I think I will in one of these uh, next few weeks, uh, Prophecy Wednesday. Because it's an interesting study. This man had 1,000 women at once, and I can explain why he had some wives and concubines. I'll explain all that. Well, David, no, it wasn't enough. I don't know how he did it, man. Hard enough with one, man. I got two females in my house. One older, one younger. I can't, it's hard. <laughs> no, it's good. He had unlimited resources. He had unlimited resources. That's, the, that's, that's why, Dodie. It, in the Bible, if a man had unlimited resources, God allowed that. I'll explain this to the concubines, but he, he'll, he'll allow. You ever notice, all the way back to Genesis, we didn't, when we were looking at Cain, we didn't see that part. But right after Cain built the city called Enoch, after his son, uh, another man had the, the issue of multiple wives was right in the beginning, right there in Genesis chapter number four. And God allowed David to have multiple wives. He had Abigail. He had uh, Michael. He had a number of wives. And obviously Solomon had 700 wives and 300 concubines. And I'm explaining why God 
allowed them to do that, okay? We'll look at that in, 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 in that study. But it's a lot of work, too. The problem with some of Solomon's wives, they were of other nations, and they caused him to sin against God and go after their gods. That was the problem, the strange women. Now, this issue of armor, David couldn't use Saul's armor. David needed armor from God. He didn't use physical armor, but he had spiritual protection. David knew the word of God and that no people would stand against Israel. And David said to his, his brothers who were on the front line, all of Saul's army, for 40 straight days, Goliath came and mocked them. Goliath is not... Uh, uh, nine feet, nine inches. Dude is almost 10 feet tall. And he punked him. And he had brothers. He had four brothers there. And they were probably all that, that size, too. And they, for 40 days, Goliath would come and mock the people of Israel. And there's Saul and his army just standing there like a bunch of. David says, What are y'all doing? And David's spiritual protection wasn't in his size. He was a young man. It was in because he knew the word that nobody's going to stand against the God of Israel and his army. And David went out there with five smooth stones. But Goliath and his four brothers, all he needed was one. Because as soon as he struck Goliath, he killed him. And everybody else ran for the Philistines and they, and they get beat. But the point is, David had spiritual protection. It wasn't physical protection. Same with us. I want to show you that our spiritual protection is not, it's, not, um, uh, it's not made of metal and so forth, like the Roman soldiers. Notice here, I want you to see Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the who? In the Lord. Listen, it's the righteous judge who's going to make us strong. And in the power of his might. What's his might? It's the grace message. The way the Lord is mighty today, his mighty power worketh through the grace of God, through the message of grace. Verse 11. Put on the whole armor of who? God. It's God's own armor. It's the armor he provides. Let's say it like that. It's his spiritual protection. And why do we need spiritual protection? That, verse 11, ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Hey, he's a wily coyote out there, man. Okay? I remember growing up, wily coyote. Satan's like that. Animals describe being, other beings, whether it's human beings or uh, angelic beings or uh, spiritual beings. The, the Lord says he's subtle through Paul. He says he's subtle. He's wily. He, he tricks you. He gets, he gets the truth a little bit right there, and then he takes it away. Or he'll counterfeit it in such that it looks real. Uh, it is said that when people are, are uh, working for the United States Treasury, in the, in the, where they print the money, that the, the, the first training they get is, they, they go through the papers and stuff, but they put them for, for, for a number of months, and all they do is handle the printed money, the real thing. They don't have to show them a thousand different counterfeit bills. They just constantly show them the real bills, that to the point they can look at it and examine it so thoroughly that as soon as you hand them a, a counterfeit, they, they know it is. Do you know we should be that way with, with the truth of God's word? That's why you have to rightly divide God's word, because Satan will give you the word. He will tempt you like he tempted the Lord, but he won't rightly divide it. So it's the con everything. The con that's the number one. Dodie, you said it. The number one tool in the Bible student's toolbox is context, context, context. It's always context. God wants us to be like those bill examiners at the treasury, to know the real thing, to know the counterfeit by knowing the real thing, okay? How do you get the real thing? You go through Paul's epistles. You study what we do each week. The reason why we go verse by verse is because I want you to know the truth of God's word rightly divided. That's why he says, the wiles of the earth, verse 12, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. The battle's not against people. You see how much hatred out there? Uh, I, I tell Krista, I don't care about birthdays and stuff, but I'm always reminded of my birthday because you know what's coming up? It's on election day. And throughout my life, it's been constantly on election days, you know, every few years. And so anytime you turn the TV on, two days to the election, I go, yeah, then, two, you know. 
It always reminded, November 6th, here it come. Well, that issue uh, of all the hatred and stuff, you're in this part or that part, uh, that's the way the world is. It's just a mess out there. But really, this, in a spiritual battle, it's not about people per se. People are being manipulated by Satan. Let me show you that. For we, verse 12, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against what? Against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of what? This world. I want you to see that these are, these are ruling authorities. We can't see them with our physical eyes, but they're real. Notice, principalities, powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. Do you know this world has satanic rulership? Satan and his angels and his devils. So we grace believers aren't to take the fight out on people. We're to love them because they're being controlled by the devil. Go back to Ephesians chapter 2. Look what he says there. You in Ephesians 6? Go back to chapter 2. Look at verse 1 and 2. We need to know that we should never work ill towards a person. We need to know that we must love them whether they're saved or not. Verse 1, Ephesians 2. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Verse 2. Wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world. Remember Paul says in Romans 12, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. The course of this world according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Listen, Satan controls all these lost people, okay? And he can even energize saints, uh, members of the body. Paul calls them evil workers. But I want you to see verse 3, among whom also we all, that's every one of us here, we all had our conversation in time past in the lust of our flesh, and when you're in the lust of your flesh, what do you do? Fulfilling the desires of the flesh, that's your outward man, and of the mind, that's your inward man, and we're by nature. We were born this way, the children of wrath, even as, even as others. That brother said, hey, man, I, it's going to be hard for me to see my family at the great white throne. I get that, man. But listen, if they're children of disobedience, if they allow Satan to continue to rule over them, you got a choice. We all have a choice. Everybody in here saved because we made a choice to say, forget, I'm not going to listen to Satan. I'm going to listen to God through the Apostle Paul, and I'm going to get saved. Trust Christ. Well, but God, see? Satan is not more powerful than our father. And so God puts something out there. But God, who is rich in what? Mercy. For his great love, Satan doesn't love you. Only person he loves is himself. He uses you. But God, for his great, for his great love, where it, wherein he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, when we were spiritually dead, hath quickened us, made us alive together, with who? With Christ. By grace ye are saved. Amen. Amen. Don't ever take that for granted. Every day you wake up, you say, I am saved. When you see what's going to happen at the great white throne, you're going to be thankful for your salvation in Christ. Every day, if you don't have anything else to be thankful for, mm -hmm. thank you, dear Lord, that I'm saved by your grace through Christ Jesus. Okay? You're no longer a child of disobedience, a child of wrath. Well, they're run by the, the satanic powers. Go back to uh, chapter 6, Ephesians chapter 6. And so because we know that, we don't, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but we do wrestle. Verse 12, Ephesians 6, 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers. Listen, I told you. I said, I'm feeling older this year because I think since we moved to California seven years ago in the spiritual darkness, I call it the, the Bermuda Triangle of darkness. You got the Bay Area, you got Sacramento, the seat of authority, and then down... And Hollywood and so forth, that triangle, and it's just satanic, and it's just throwing this stuff in there. 
I can't explain it, but when we go back to Minnesota, because there's more grace churches in the Midwest, it's not, a, it's not as heavy a lift spiritually. It's not. It's not. And then when we returned to California, I could just feel it. Krista, we were talking about the first time we visited San Francisco. It's a lot of drug use. You can't even walk in the park. We were with Fernando. Fernando says, hey, Brother Ron, watch it, because we, we have to watch as we walk into a park in San Francisco where he lives, it's needles and drug needles and stuff. You, you can go into a BART station, and people actually shooting up on the ground. It's, it's, it's crazy. That doesn't happen everywhere. It doesn't. It doesn't. Can I say, listen, it's just spiritual. So I say, I remember our first time visiting, and uh, we were down in Chinatown area. Krista didn't know she had gotten us. She gets a good deal on a hotel. We were, we were ministering here, but we flew in there. And so we stayed there. She couldn't be, she wasn't settled. Her spirit wasn't settled. We were trying, so they had all of this dark stuff going on at this park right next to the thing that night and that morning. She <coughs> felt better in the daytime, but when we came in that night, we, we left Folsom and we went out there. Now we've gotten used to it. We've gotten used to that. But when we first moved here, we could, our spirits could feel the darkness. It's, it's real, is what I'm saying. Because look what he says. There is, there is spiritual wickedness, verse 12. The rulers of the darkness of this world against spiritual wickedness in high places. This defines the enemy and the arena. Our enemy is Satan and his, and his hordes, both his angels, the devil's angels, and his de uh, devils those disembodied spirits and so forth, and they, and they fight constantly against the, grace, the, the members of the body of Christ. <laughs> that has to do with, high, high places in particularly is places of, yeah, uh, in the Old Testament it's places of worship, they would go to high points in Israel and the hills and stuff, and they'd build idols and they'd worship the devils there, okay? <laughs> this high places have to do with like what we'd say the heavenly place in the heavens. The heavens, yeah. Well, well, no, no, it, it does in this way, Dodie. Every government of man, Satan wants to control that. Yeah. Now he can't control a, a member of this of our of a government if they're saved. They have a fighting chance. But if they're not saved, then he can he can definitely influence and, and control. Verse number thirteen. Wherefore take unto you the whole, the entire, what? armor of God take the armor that God gives you take the spiritual protection he's going to go through it he says that here's the purpose ye may be able to withstand in the evil day now the evil day here is one day when Paul was writing this he was getting visions and revelations all Satan knew of the mystery is what God revealed to Paul he didn't know the mystery Satan but as Paul is writing it down and eventually the whole scripture, all scriptures is finished, all scriptures given, Satan now has the mystery. And he has made a, 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 lie, a, a lie program to go against it. That's the evil day. There's a day when he's going to know this stuff and he's going to fight, uh, fight, fight us knowing it. Talking about the mystery. And we're there. Once God completed the mystery through the Apostle Paul, Satan now has all the information and all he has to do is put the word of God out there, but just don't rightly divide it. Don't give you this. You ever notice that most churches, here's where they focus on, the four gospels. You ever notice that? Yes. Just turn the radio on. We're on, we're on the radio. The guy before me, AM 1410, his program is called the gospel of the kingdom. That's his program. Then I come on and I, and I preach about the gospel of the grace of God. This <laughs> happens all the time. I remember back in Minnesota, I, it was, I did uh, public access videos. And uh, this Jewish, Jewish guy was on uh, right after me. I came on teaching grace. I was teaching the book of Galatians, first I've heard. This guy, he must have caught on, or people watching his show must have caught my show. Because he found out, because then that guy, it was almost like whatever I was teaching, he was like, no, you know, Paul, not Paul, it's this, that, and it was the law. And it was, it was kind of comical. Four Gospels. That's what you focus on. That's Mark Luke and John. So it is the word of God, isn't it? Yeah. But it's not the rightly divided word of God. So in that evil day, Satan now 
can withstand and hide the mystery from people. Not forever, because you can choose to see it. Why do we exist as a ministry? To teach people the mystery. I get people who are right or call says, Brother Ron, I've never heard this, but I get it. I'm learning it. I had ministers call me. Ministers. Pastors, teachers. They would say, I've been teaching something else for 30 years. Amen for that. Now, they don't happen often, but some do. Praise God for that. God. It takes some humility to say, I've been teaching this one way for 30 years, <coughs> and now I'm learning the rightly divided word from you, and I'm, I'm, I'm yes, sir. One guy told me he's never heard of suffering. Never heard of, right. No. The, the, the exact thing we ought to do in order to be joint heirs with Christ, as Paul says in Romans 8. Because Satan wants to take that truth away. Yes. Let's keep going. But that's that evil day, and having done all, to stand. I always think about the people of Israel when I talked about it in last Wednesday, that they got to the Red Sea, they could do nothing. The, mountain, the, the, the mountains were on each side. The approaching Egyptian army, Pharaoh and his army, was behind them in a rage, wrath. The Red Sea, which represents death. It was Rod, Rod, I think they just went across the street to the uh, store there. He said that the, he gave me the length and, 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 and breadth of the thing. It was a mighty miracle of God. And what God told them through Moses is stand still and see the salvation of our Lord. Hey, there's nothing more you can do. You have the truth. You put, the, put it on and you stand like a, 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 a soldier. Notice in verse 14, stand therefore having your loins girt about with what? Truth. It always starts with the truth. And you know what he says early in Ephesians? The truth is in Jesus. Where's I am the way, the truth, and the life? Listen, people always ask, what is truth? Your truth, my truth, shut up. The truth is in Jesus. It's the word of God rightly divided. It's Christ according to Revelation of Mystery. That's where truth is. Brother Ron, what do you think about this? What does Paul say about it? That's my response. What does the apostle Paul say about it? Sometimes Paul mentions it. Sometimes he doesn't. He's silent about it. What does the rest of the word say about it? I, I, you got to train your mind to think, what does the Bible say about it? What did the Lord say to Satan? It is what? Written. Satan says this. The Lord says, it is written. Thou shall not, uh, thou shall not worship anyone but the Lord thy God. Verse number 14. We're in Ephesians 6, 14. Stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth. And having on the breastplate of righteousness, that righteousness is faith and love. You have to wake up every day and say, do I believe the mystery? Yes. Faith in the Lord Jesus. And love to all his saints. Do I show my love for Christ by ministering to the saints? And only you can answer that. I can't answer it for you. I could say that I, I know you all. Many of you all here. In fact, every one of you guys and the rest of the saints who are not here have in some way blessed my life personally and my family's life, my wife and child and my parents. We do appreciate your love. The fact that you're here shows me love. The fact that you are here, or, or those who watch by way, it shows your appreciation for our ministry. Righteousness. The breastplate over in 1 Thessalonians 5, he calls it the breastplate of faith and love. That's what righteousness is, faith and love. Do you wake up and say, thank you, Lord, for the mystery? And do you say, now give me a chance to love my brethren? And when we're not together, as you have therefore opportunity, let us do good to all men, Galatians 6.10 says, but especially those of the household of faith. We put priority to our brothers and sisters in Christ, but you need to love all these people. Notice verse 15, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. That's the believer's good news. That's the thing that you have peace with God. Satan wants you to think. He wants you to slip. He wants you to think that God is somehow against you because of your circumstances in life, maybe, and whatever. He wants you to doubt your father's love. And remember, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. God is never against the, believer, the, 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 the member of the body. I was going to say the believers, but Ryan and I were talking about even that. We say members of the body because you, he says, if we believe not, yet he abideth faithful. A member of the body can stop believing the mystery, and God still loves them. And God, you'll never lose your salvation. That's the peace of God. 
to know that the moment you chose to trust Christ as your Savior, it's a done deal forever. You have peace with God. Verse number 16. Above all, taking the shield of what? Faith. The shield of faith has to do with, well, look at verse 16. Wherewith he shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Do you know in our passage, he talks about the armor of righteousness. He didn't say in the right hand or in the left hand. Sorry about that. I got the wind blowing. Um, hold your hand here. Go back and look at our passage. Go to 2 Corinthians 6, verse 7. I want to show you something. Because he doesn't say the armor of righteousness in the right hand and in the left hand. He says on, right? On. So you put it on. On your right side and left side to, to protect, protect yourself. Obviously, you got a breastplate and a back plate and so forth. But you got to protect the sides, too. Satan is a wily little, little character. He likes to get you. He, he, he tries to find other ways to penetrate you. They say with, with, with bulletproof vest and so forth. There have been times where police officers have been killed. They had their vest on, but they'll get shot right there in the part that's not protected, right? And that was a vulnerable part for a soldier battling, too. Uh, it wasn't these full armors as we would see it like in the medieval times, right? You see in the Scooby-Doo in the house and the guy with the eyes and the thing like that. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was more a coat, coat of mail, they call it. It, it, was, it, it, was, it was soft enough where they can do hand-to-hand -hand combat. It wasn't like all stiff. And so there were parts that you had to beware so they, they, they could protect themselves. It says on, but you know what? <coughs> There's something that you have in your right hand and in your left hand. Watch this. Uh, 2 Corinthians 6, 7 says, uh, by, uh, verse 7, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the arm of righteousness on the right hand and on the left. But go back to Ephesians 6. There's something you're going to have in your right hand and your right hand in your left hand. And what is that? Let's look at it. You got it. Verse number 16, above all, taking the shield of faith. And, and it, usually the right hand is the, is the, is the, is the hand of power. I, I heard this statistic because I'm left-handed. 10% of the population is left-handed. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's an interesting study in the Bible about when the Bible mentions left-handedness. Okay? The reason most people shake with their right hand is that's your hand you held your weapon with. So as a gesture to say you're not going to stab somebody, although in the Bible sometimes they do that and then they do that right there. But where that comes from is your, your your powerful hand is empty. It doesn't have a weapon against your enemy, so you shook hand. That's where we get that. 90% of, of people are right-handed by nature, right? I'm a left. I can do both. I'm, I'm ambidextrous. I write left-handed, but I hit. I can do other stuff writing. I, I use both. This issue of in, the, in that, that warrior would put on his left hand, notice verse 16, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Now, this wasn't even hand-to-hand. -hand. Sometimes they would do it from afar, and they'd take these fiery darts and, and try to burn you up like that, right? Shoot them over. And you would block it. And how do you block Satan's fiery darts? By faith. By believing God's word. So when he comes with this nonsense, you could say, it is written, and you listen to what the Apostle Paul says. Verse 17, and take the helmet of salvation. Now over in 1 Thessalonians 5, he says, and foreign helmet, the hope of salvation. And what that means is one day, with all the bad stuff that's going on in this world, one day the Lord's going to take us out of here. That salvation is saved or delivered from the very presence of sin. In other words, we're not going to have to live in this sin-cursed world forever, okay? Thank God. One day this stuff is going to change, and the Lord Jesus is going to be in charge. But even before he comes back, we're going to heaven. So take that. Don't let Satan have you thinking, like, like he did in that day, that you were going to go through the tribulation period. By the way, if you're in the four Gospels, if people are in the four Gospels, Eventually, you're going to get to passages that not only talking about you can lose your salvation, but that you're going to go, the, the Lord Jesus prepared 
Matthew 24 and so forth, uh, 24 and 25. He's preparing his, the Lord Jesus is preparing his disciples to go through the tribulation. He's going to baptize them with fire. Paul never tells the body of Christ that we're going to go through the tribulation. That issue of that verse 17, look at Ephesians 6, 17, and take the helmet. A helmet protects your head. That's where your mind, your thinking is. So you put it on. And take the helmet of salvation. Hold, it, hold your hand there. Go, to, uh, go, go a few books forward to 1 Thessalonians, if you will, chapter 5. The helmet of salvation. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 8. <clears throat> if you're not rightly dividing the word of truth, people can talk you into thinking you're going to go through the tribulation period. The time of Jacob's trouble, it's called in Jeremiah. I think Jeremiah 4, 23. My, my point is, we're not appointed to wrath. Look at uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, verse number 8. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 8. But let us who are of the day, remember we're of the day, be sober, clear-minded, clear putting on the breastplate of faith and love. Now in Ephesians 6, he called it the breastplate of righteousness. So I, he defines what righteousness is. Faith in the Lord Jesus and love to his saints. Put that on. That protects your heart. You know God wants you to have a soft heart towards him and towards others. And so what protects your heart is love the Lord Jesus and love his saints. Protects your heart. Don't have ill will in your heart. Verse number uh, eight. But let us who are of the day be sober, put it on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet, the hope of salvation. Now that doesn't mean we hope we're going to be saved. And I don't know if I'm saved or not. Maybe I am, maybe I'm not. We know we're saved from the penalty of our sin. The hope of salvation is that blessed hope that we're going to be taken out of this world. How do we know that? Look at the rest of verse 9. For, here's the explanation. For God hath not appointed us to what? Wrath. Wrath but to obtain salvation. Our rescuer is coming. By our, and by the way, why does he call him the Lord Jesus Christ? Because when, when that rapture happens, we're going to the judgment seat. Lord means the righteous judge. That's right. The Lord Jesus Christ. So when he returns, when we meet him in the air, the chapter previously, 1 Thessalonians 4, says that we'll be delivered from the presence of sin. Most people look at the rapture as just us going out of this world before the, before the uh, seventh week of the, 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 tri the tribulation. But it's the thing that takes us to the judgment seat of Christ. Yeah, it's where the Lord, the righteous judge. That's right, our reward. That's right. This is where we get judged. By the Lord, not for, our, not for our salvation from sin, our works. Our works are judged, okay? All right. Verse number 17, Ephesians 6, 17. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit. If, if, if the shield of faith is in your left hand, what's in your right hand? Unless you're left-handed, I'm sorry. What's well, left, you know, 10% of us are going to have the opposite. It's so funny because the Bible talk about these left-handed guys, and boy, they could shoot <coughs> or arrow or sling a song or something. They, they, were, they were very skilled at what they did. And they also say that most, even though the population is 10% lefty, you get a lot of the so -so successful people are mostly left-handed and stuff like that. Interesting. <laughs> I'm not one of them. <laughs> yes, you are. No. But they, they do say that a lot of what they call geniuses are left handed. That's a thing. That's what people say, the studies, whatever. Um, I'm definitely not that. You know what, though? That issue of, I'm going to use it the way the Bible talks about the right hand is the hand of power. You have that shield of faith, the sword of the spirit, which is what? The word of God. Go to Hebrews chapter number we, we just four. Over in yes, we did. We're going we're gonna to go it. Yeah. Which is the word of God. That's right. The sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Go over to Hebrews chapter number four. Hebrews chapter number four. The sword of the spirit. It's the sword that the spirit of God wields himself. 
when you first see that sword is in Genesis 3 when God kicked Adam out and he had cherubim with flaming swords to keep the way. Hebrews 4.12. For the word of God is quick and what? Powerful. And sharper than any two-edged sword. Piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. That's your inner man. God is, God's word is able to divide that. And of the joints and marrow, where would that appear? That would be in your body, your physical body, the joints, the marrow. I love this. And is a discerner of the thoughts. See, somebody jamming out there. <laughs> the, the, the discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. God's word <coughs> reads you as you read it. That's why the more you have it in you or the more you get it, that's how he cleanses you. He cleanses you. Verse number 13, love this part. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight. Everything, well, notice, but all things are, this is great, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. That's the Hebrew. Can I tell y'all something? Before Almighty God, we're all naked. Adam and Eve were. They didn't have nothing to be worried about. God made them. <laughs> it's funny. Jada Lynn's nine. And uh, she's at that age. She says, Daddy, don't look at me. She's been, anyway, she's, she's, she's in her undies. And I look at her. I say, first of all, when you were a baby, I, I did some of those, changed some of those blowouts too, OK? <laughs> I know what's going on. Don't have to worry. I'm your daddy, OK? I give her. You were the same way with me. Oh, well. I get, I get that. Maybe the opposite sex per, uh, parent or whatever. But anyway, I, <laughs> Krista did most of it because I'm not a good diaper changer. But boy, one day we were at this uh, fitness center and Krista was, she's a runner, right? She ran that marathon in Twin Cities in 03. And you know, I walk. <laughs> I, I ain't running nowhere. I am training for my 50th birthday to the, uh, <laughs> the, uh, uh, the, what I call that, the fantasy camp. I'm be ready. I told Krista, I will run for the next four years just for that. <laughs> uh, we live in Fair Oaks near uh, Fair Oaks and San Juan. And every December, first Sunday of December, which is coming up in a month, the marathon comes right by our house. And for the past few years, I'd go out there. Sometimes if Jada Lynn up, I'll take her. Krista's still asleep. Because about an hour in, we're right at the 13 mile mark. We're right halfway. So I just look, and here come, here come those African guys just coming. And then it's a, it's a break for about five minutes, then some other runners. So I, I always get up there. When Christopher wakes up, I said, I'm going to run this year. I'm going to start running. By the next day, I said, I'm not running. <laughs> but I'm, I get motivated because they're people who look like me. They're scragglers, right? Y'all know this because we always have to uh, push our church time back. Remember that? Because they walk off the streets. Well, now we're good because we started at 11. So. But the point is, I always motivate it because when I see them. But then the next day, I said, no, nah, I'm not motivated. <laughs> I'm not. But I love the fact that God, to God, it's all naked and open. That's why it was weird to God when Adam and Eve says, we're, we, we were naked and we were ashamed and we hid ourselves. He says, who told you you were naked? Like, I, I see you. I'm, I'm your father. Don't have to worry about that. But see, they had sinned against their father. And when you sin against the father, they, they, that, it took away their holiness, their innocence, yes. <coughs> And therefore, they knew that they were naked, it says, and they feared God because they were disobedient. And can I tell you what God has done? He wants us to be so open before him. We're naked before him anyway. He wants us to be so open that by knowing his word and, and believing his word, not, not performing it perfectly, y'all. I'm the most imperfect man <coughs> that y'all will ever know. I'm telling you that. But I know that I can be honest before God and just say he accepts me just who I am. That's why I can be a grace minister, because I can just set, set people the way they are. I'm going to help them grow and stuff, and God wants us to grow. But I just say, Lord, if you want to do it. I knew God's grace is, it'll be 20, 24 years. I knew I wasn't good enough for God and that he had to accept me. If, as long as you have that attitude, God, he's not pounding you for your, for your weakness. 
The only person I could be that weak before is Krista anyway. He's just my wife, you know. I guess my parents too, but they, you know, the man leaves his father and mother. I won't. But, and sometimes with you all, but I'm honest. God's not looking for perfect people. He's looking for broken people that he can allow the word of God and the spirit of God to build. And so just, just know you open and naked before him and live that way. And when you make mistakes, say, sorry, Heavenly Father. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for dealing with me. Just be honest. God wants you to be honest. People aren't honest with themselves and God. God wants you to be honest. I'm a, you, uh, you are a wretched man or woman. Recognize that and say, Lord, I need you. I need your help. He'll fix you. He'll fix you. That's what it is. Naked and open before him. And the more you know that, the more you get in his word and say, now, Lord, fill me with your word. Adam and Eve were supposed to approach him naked, covered with his light, his righteousness, and hear his word daily. They met with the Lord every day in the cool of the day in the garden. So when they missed their appointment that day, God says, Adam, where are you? It's time for the word. That's what they were doing. They were getting his word. God was teaching them about his creation and his purpose for man and woman when he did create the woman. And he says, I'm, I'm, where are my children at? It's time to instruct them. And they were to sit down with the Lord, and he was going to explain everything to Adam. Adam, was, Adam didn't have all knowledge. He wasn't created with all knowledge. God was going to infuse him with knowledge. The temptation was, you can be as God to knowing good and evil, but God was supposed to teach them. The way he teaches us today is through Paul's epistles. Our apostle Paul is the one that God has given for you and me to sit down at his feet and hear the word of God the way Mary did with the Lord Jesus, not like Martha, cumbered about with much serving. It's not about that. It's about first hearing the word of God, okay? So that's what you have as your offensive weapon. As we come down to the end, I wrote some stuff about uh, a fight. That armor... That whole armor of God, quite frankly, is both offensive and defensive. Uh, let me say it the other way. It's a <coughs> defensive armor, but it's an offense. We're not just to fight him off. We're to go on the attack. Why would you have a, 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 a sword in your hand? It's not to be, you know, playing around with. It's to stab. And the way you stab the devil is with the word of God. When he tempted our Lord, the Lord Jesus says, it is what? Written. And as the Satan came with his, with, with his, everything he had, the Lord says, it is written. What do we do when the devil comes? What does the word of God have to say through the apostle? What is written? This protection of our spiritual armor, it protects us from the world, the flesh, and the devil. That's what it's designed to do to protect us from the world, the flesh, and the devil. Um, go on the attack. Don't just fight them off. Stand against the adversary without fear. I think about a football team. I played football in high school, Lynn Bloom High School in Chicago, Illinois. And I played defensive back and running back. I was 16 as a six, I, I had energy then, you go. I ran for my life. <laughs> I used to run home from baseball. I, I lived in a hood called Inglewood where all the murders happened. We, we got chased home after baseball practice by the gangs, the disciples, gangster disciples and stuff. So we always had to run home anyway. That's the only running I like doing. But I played football. I played on defense and offense is the point. And, and, and you need both. And they have something called special teams, the punt return team or the kickoff return, whatever. And if you don't work as a, as a, as a, as a, as a team, you're going to lose. Your offense could be awesome. Your defense stinks. Or if, if the case of my Chicago Bears, they always had good defense, decent defenses. The offense is terrible. There's a, there's a verse called sincere and without offense to the day of Christ. That's the Bears. OK, that's what I'm <laughs> I mean, even when they won the Super Bowl, they, the offense was terrible. Bought the Peyton Manning. But can I tell you, you need both. And what God's protection is, it's both defensive and offensive. You've got the, the, the shield of faith, but you've got the sword of the spirit. You go on the attack. That's what I want you to see. 
As we end, go over to Isaiah 59. I want to show you who had the same armor. Go over to Isaiah 59. I can't even watch the bears no more, I'm going to tell you all that. Oh, they let me down too much. I did get to celebrate my friends. I was 11 years old or something. They won that Super Bowl. And that was it. They lost another one. That's the only good part about living in California. I don't get to see the Bears lose that often. <laughs> Unless they come play, the, come play in California like the 49ers. That's the only good thing there is about living in California. <laughs> the weather and you guys. The same. <laughs> yeah. Hey, we went to Yosemite because you mentioned that. People fall at Yosemite. Do you know the week after we went? This couple fell trying to take pictures. They fall all the time. Did they die? Yeah, they did. Remember I told you, everybody is every time, the last three times I've been there, somebody died. Why would you send us there? You, were you trying to tell us something? <laughs> <laughs> trying to tell me something, right? Ryan said, oh, you got to go to Yosemite. <laughs> hold on, hold on. Krista, <laughs> Krista, she got to work on Saturdays. So that's why we could never do anything. So she had a Saturday off. She says, Jada Lynn says we never take her away. So she, we said, we're going to take her to Yosemite. That was two weeks ago. And then this past week, a couple died. And Ryan tells me people died every day. He sends us to Yosemite. <laughs> but we didn't climb way up there, Ryan. We looked right. at it. <laughs> people, we saw people up there, though, like hanging out up there. We're like, that's crazy. But some people are thrill seekers. But Ryan's right. People die all the time. <coughs> that's why I joke with him. Were you trying to send me a, a, a message with I, that? I've, I've, climbed, I've climbed in Yosemite many times and I never. You still here? Never got hurt, so. You still here? Okay. Well, I'm not climbing. You think I'm? A, I tell you, who ain't climbing? You ever seen my little daughter? She ain't climbing. No. Well, I stopped climbing when I when my when I was younger. My I had health insurance through my parents, and then once it ran out, I stopped mountain climbing. Okay, that was <laughs> that was smart, right? That was wise. We got to end, but look at Isaiah chapter 59. All these this the spiritual protection he's talking about. It is the Lord's own protection Himself. Okay. Isaiah is a prophet to Israel. He gets a vision about the return of the Lord Jesus Christ in that kingdom. And notice what he says, Isaiah 59, verse number 16. We'll start with a paragraph marker. Isaiah 59, 16. And he saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no in intercessor. Who could save mankind? Who, who's out there that can help mankind? Now, the people in that day are going to think it's going to be the Antichrist, he can't do it. There's only one man who could save mankind. Notice verse 16, and he saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore, his arm, his arm, the Lord says, man can't do it, I have to do it. Therefore, his arm brought what? Salvation unto him. And his righteousness, it sustained him. Listen, God says, if you want something done right, you got to do it yourself. He says, I'm going to do it. Verse 17, for he put on righteousness as a what? Why would Paul tell us to wear a breastplate of righteousness? Because the Lord Jesus will, did and will. And a helmet of salvation upon his head. Paul is quoting this passage in both Ephesians and 1 Thessalonians. The Lord Jesus Christ has a helmet of salvation upon his head. And he put on the garments of what? Now, this is him coming in the second coming to pour out wrath. Vengeance is mine, I will replace, saith the Lord, for, for clothing, and was, and was clad with zeal as a what? Cloak. He was zealous. The zeal, you ever read when it says the zeal of the Lord were performing? I said this is going to be the last one, but you know what? Go over to Revelation 19. I can't, I got to end how, how, on this one. Revelation 19. Now, what we just read in Isaiah 59 it's picked up over here. Get Revelation 1 and Revelation 19. Revelation 1, Revelation 19. Then we'll end. Revelation 1, Revelation 19. This is appearance of the Lord. Revelation 1, 16. Revelation 1, 16. John sees this vision. And he had in his right hand seven stars. And out of his mouth went a sharp, what? Two-edged sword. And his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. Mm. Now that's the Lord return in prophecy. 
But don't you ever forget what the Apostle Paul says when he saw the Lord Jesus in mystery. It didn't say that he shone as the sun. He said he was brighter than the noonday sun. Grace is more glorious than law. Don't forget that. Prophecy always says the sun, the sun of righteousness, Malachi. When Paul talks about seeing the Lord, he says brighter than the sun. What God has given us is better than anything. All right, we got to end in Revelation 19. Look at verse 11. Revelation 19, verse 11. Now, don't, you can read this on your own in Revelation 6, but there's another guy on a, on, a, on a white horse, but it's not the Lord. It's the Antichrist. He comes as the counterfeit. He's going to ride a white horse. He's going to bring peace in the world. Peace, peace. Don't, 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 don't listen to him, the, the Revelation 6, <coughs> 6 one. That's a man. Listen to this one, because this is the Lord Jesus. Revelation 19, verse 11. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called, what? Faithful and true. And in righteousness, remember Isaiah said righteousness? He doth judge and make war. God's going to pour out his wrath righteously. Verse 12. His eyes were as a flame of fire. <clears throat> and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. We didn't see that in Isaiah 59, but that's not his blood. That's their blood. The prophet said, what are these stains on your raiment? He says, that's the blood that I avenged. Okay. We got in. And his name is called the word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, and out of his mouth. And here's what I want you to see. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword. And what he's going to do with it? That with it he should smite the nations. That's what he's going to do in his kingdom. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress. That's why his garments are stained. Of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. That's where that song came from. What's that, Dodie? My eyes have seen the glory. Of the coming of the Lord. Yes. It comes from right yes. It's passages like this where it comes. In Matthew 25, when the Son of Man comes in power and great glory. That's a great battle cry. Hey, the Lord's coming. The Lord is at hand. The Lord is at hand. And whether it's coming to receive us first, take us to the judgment seat, and eventually come back to pour out his wrath on this world, he's coming. So I want you guys to be strengthened by that. Take the spiritual armor, the spiritual protection, the same one the Lord Jesus wears. The word of God and how to apply that word of God in, in the details of your life okay we'll look at this issue of um, honor and dishonor no, unknown but yet well known as deceivers but true and all that uh, if the Lord tarries another week we'll look at that next Sunday okay if you're listening you never trusted the Lord Jesus Christ you don't want to be a part of that <clears throat> you don't want to be here when he comes for out his wrath and you don't want to be at his great white throne judgment you want to be with us, the body, in the, heaven, in the heavens at the judgment seat of Christ. And you want to get a full reward. That's what we're to do. It starts with salvation. Trust Christ as your Savior. He died for your sins. Trust that alone. And if you're saved today, don't waste time in a religious system or churches that don't rightly divide. Get this time. The Lord is at hand. And the only way you're going to be equipped to deal with the righteous judge is if you hear, hear the Apostle Paul. Our ministry exists to teach the word of God through Paul and all the rightly divided word of God, the entire Bible, okay? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for time this morning to come and be with those of like precious faith, both those who are here with us in person. We have a number of saints out, but they're with us in spirit. But we also, for the blessing of technology, uh, uh, to, to, to share these things with those who aren't with us here uh, in the flesh. So we thank you for that, Father. We ask that... Uh, your wonderful message of grace continues to uh, uh, go out freely, Father, and, and abundantly, that we might open our mouth boldly and get these things out to others. We thank you for the privilege and honor of having another day of grace, both to share it in our lives, but to give it to others. Father, as we go forth in our days, may your great grace and mercy be with one and all. Thank you for this time together, and we thank you in Christ's name. Amen.